we were like, look, you're not allowed to hit me in the head. So we'll do yeah. shoulder taps and knee taps to work on like reactions and speed. Yeah. And you went for my shoulder and I, I ducked yeah. and I uh, put my, my eye right in the line of fire. <laughs> <laughs> Hey everybody, it's John Lamerton here alongside my good friend and business partner, Mr. Jason Brockman. We are here for another episode of the Ambitious Lifestyle Business Podcast, where as always, it is our job to help you get more customers and make more money without just working harder. So without further ado, let's dive straight into this month's episode. Today, we welcome back our first ever returning guest. Uh, I'm not sure whether our previous guests are refusing to return or whether we're refusing to let them come back. What do you, what do you think, Jace? I think, uh, yeah, it takes someone to come back again, doesn't it, to come through this process, this intense <laughs> interview. Um, you really need a good action man to kind of come and get through this, uh, this grilling um, without the hood, maybe, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So anyway, we, we last spoke to today's guest uh, way back in episode 49 of the Ambitious Lifestyle Business Podcast, February 2019, by my reckoning. Um, now, in that episode, he was unveiled as a business partner of ours and blew us away with his dedication, commitment to constant, never-ending improvement and his approach to physical challenges. Uh, fast forward three and a half years, we are no longer business partners I've punched him in the face and given him a black eye. <laughs> and he's been on your television screens recently, uh, taking on the toughest physical, mental, and emotional challenge you could possibly imagine. Channel 4's SAS, Who Dares Wins. Uh, please welcome back to the Ambitious Lifestyle Business Podcast, Mr. Tom Bowden. Thank you for the nice introduction. <laughs> That's not bad, is it? Are we allowed to call you Tom now? Or we just call you 19. <laughs> no, I prefer Tom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tom's fine. Fantastic. Let's let's address the, that elephant in the room straight off the bat. So we are we are no longer business partners. No. Nope. What happened there? Um, I think it just naturally ran its course. Really, I think there was. Um, I, I think the business that that I was involved in. I think I just wanted to go in a different direction. Um, I. Obviously, a lot happened in my life. That, so there was a lot of changes that went on um, around what I wanted out of life, what I wanted out of a business. Um, and I just don't think it married up anymore. Um, so, yeah, I just had to make that decision. It was a difficult decision because I was really happy um, with what I was doing. But I think, yeah, f- following that sort of life-changing thing, it just it just didn't fit with my sort of values anymore. So it was time to, to move on and do, do my own thing. Absolutely. There was a little trigger point, wasn't there, where kind of it, yeah. was, it was we had to make a decision regarding the kind of future direction of the business. And That's it. Yeah. As you said, with everything that happened, obviously we'll talk about that um shortly. With everything that happened, you naturally reevaluated all of life's decisions. And as you said, what yeah. you wanted out of life. Yeah, it's yeah, what I wanted out of life and what I wanted out of a business. And yeah, just just it just makes you reevaluate everything you're doing, really. Um yeah. Yeah. It was interesting because when we, I think when we first talked, um, we mentioned, I think the local news article, five million pound hot shots was the headline they went <laughs> with. And yeah, we were talking about building a big business at that time, weren't we? Yeah, we were. Yeah. That was the goal. Yeah. And ultimately, as we'll discover in a minute, we're now li- you're now living that ambitious lifestyle business again. Yeah. So on, definitely. on that previous podcast, we talked about, your physical challenges particularly i think we talked about your bodybuilding challenge back in the day yeah getting down to like single digit body fat and the key takeaway that i certainly had from that was that you don't half ass anything no no i don't um if you're committed you're all in aren't you yeah there's no there's no middle ground with me so if I once I make a decision if that's what I'm doing then that is what I'm doing and it's going to take something pretty big to stop me um yeah yeah once the decision's made it's made yeah yeah because I I think I kind of I got a bit curious because I've always looking to drop body fat and I remember saying to you on that podcast so what do you do then and I think you answered well I went I did cardio twice a day seven days a week yeah and ate 
chicken, broccoli, and brown rice yeah. three times a day at these exact times yeah. for four months. Yeah, and God, it was a miserable four months. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. At which point I thought, yeah, I don't want to do that. No, I don't blame you. I wouldn't do it again. <laughs> I wouldn't do it again. It's it's one of those one one time things. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. Speaking of one time things, so <laughs> that summer after the, we did that podcast, we went to the football. And you mentioned to me, you said, oh, I've just signed up for this boxing challenge, ultimate white collar boxing. And I went, I've been looking to do that. That's that's on my goal list. And it's all Jason's fault, as we've talked about on oh, yeah. podcasts before. Jason. Jason didn't join us, though. No, no, no. He was just, he just planted the seed, <laughs> didn't you, Jason? No, that was it. I wasn't allowed to, was I? I <laughs> 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 get punched in the face, really, but it didn't work that way out. <laughs> so we... We both signed up to do it, and we were in the same cohort of this ultimate white-collar boxing. And as I said, we have talked about my experience of white-collar boxing on this podcast um, several times. For those who haven't heard the story before, uh, my boxing career lasted one minute and 19 seconds, Yeah, and I finished second. Yeah, well done. (laughs) (laughs) It was a fine 20 seconds, in fairness. It was, it was, it, I was going to say it went by in a blink of an eye, but it, it didn't because no. when they said at the end it was one minute and 19 seconds, I'm like, no, it wasn't. The bell was just about to ring for the three minutes. Like, no, it wasn't. You were not yeah. even halfway through. <laughs> um, so we were training together. Um, and again, not half assing things. We were doing, I think it was Tuesday and Thursday and extra sessions if you were Tom Bolden. Yeah. Uh, it would just say, well, I'll just do a double session in between. Um, and I sent you a text or a WhatsApp message on a Sunday morning. It was Sunday, the 13th of October. And my message to you read, not looking forward to training on Tuesday. I've got a stinking code right now. And you replied to that message almost immediately with, I think my boxing career is over, mate. Can you talk us through what happened the night before that made me feel like a right whinging bastard for saying I had a code? Oh, that's, that has honestly just sh- sent a shiver down my spine, honestly. Mm. I, like, yeah. Cool. That's strange hearing that. Um, so... Obviously, I was in a bit of a confused state at that point and kind of that was a strange text to reply, but I clearly wasn't thinking very straight or just, yeah, yeah. Um, So Sunday the 12th, because that was Monday the 13th, wasn't it? Was that Monday the 13th? It was Sunday 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 the 13th, yeah. So Saturday night, we, me and my wife, Helen, were invited to a birthday party and it was down in Cornwall and we had decided that we we were going to go. I wasn't going to drink. I said that I would be the designated driver. And um, we left the house at about 7 p.m. Um, well, about 20 minutes into the journey, we were, we were heading down and a car coming on the opposite side of the road ended up on the wrong side of the road and hit us head on. So we were in a head on collision with the other car. So there was no time to react. There's nothing we could have done. It just happened so quick. Um, which resulted in uh, it was quite so it was a very serious accident. Actually, it was quite high speed, so we were doing about fifty. It was fifty mile an hour zone. We were doing, I think it was fifty two miles an hour, and they were doing closer to sixty. Uh, so it was head on. So it was quite an impact. Um, stuck in the car for a while. They got me out first. Um, then they brought Helen into the hospital after I'd been there for about an hour, and she suffered quite serious injuries. So she had two fractures to her spine. Um, she had broken her ribs and she also had two tears to her bowel, which needed life-saving surgery. So we were told that they needed to take her into theatre within the hour or she wasn't going to make it. Um, so if anyone doesn't know how serious uh, a tear to your bowel is, you'll be poisoned quite quickly and it can turn nasty very quickly. So they had to act really quick on that. Um, yeah, so that's so the next morning would have been when I messaged you. So I hadn't slept at that point. Um, I had just, they actually discharged me from the hospital. They actually said, you, you can leave. And I don't know how I walked away from the accident. And we've seen pictures of the car now. And I have no idea um, how I came out with a few bruises. Um, and, and I mean, a quite bad whiplash. And obviously I had quite a bad concussion as well, um, which actually didn't start causing me trouble until a couple of weeks later. It was a bit of a delayed sort of thing. 
Um, so yeah, the ne- next morning when you messaged me, I was sat in the hospital waiting room and I hadn't slept. And obviously I was still trying to process what, what the hell had just happened. Yeah. And then you had some idiot send you a message saying, I've got a bit of a runny nose <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know if I'll be able to train in yeah. a couple of days time. <laughs> well, it was at that point, Helen was still in intensive care. So it's very restricted visiting hours. So she was on a lot of different uh, machines and stuff and they weren't sure what, what, what was going to happen. Um, and it turned out that the fracture in her spine was so complex because of previous spinal issues she had when she was younger that they didn't want to risk operating. So she basically had to lie in hospital on her back for 66 days in total, um, not knowing what the outcome would be at the end of it. So, yeah, it was a long time of uncertainty and worry and, yeah, just not a very nice time. It was. And it was a, there was a lot of um, sort of almost one step forward, two steps back with Helen's yeah. recovery. And, you know, one minute, one minute you thought, okay, it's going to be okay. And then yeah. the next it's like, well, we, I think we've done an MRI and it's not fusing together as we wanted, yeah. you know, oh yeah, actually, you know, and this is months later now, this is, you know, you, it wasn't just one night of a, we had, we had a bad crash and then we, we no. recovered it. It was a nice steady linear path to recovery. No, it was, it was absolutely a roller coaster. And, um, what what I found most difficult about it was going to see Helen in that state in hospital and going home again on my own to an empty house and then every morning waking up and having to go into the hospital again and it was like it was all starting again and I, it was just every day for over two months of every day thinking right now I'm back in hospital so obviously I, I didn't work I was still business partners of yours at the time and I you know you two um, and David were, were great um, really supportive and just you know left me well and gave me the support I needed but also said look there is no rush for you to come back you you need to be with your family um but yeah it was just it was just a crazy time and when I think back to it I was just a complete shell and I I had there was I, I don't know what was going on in my head I don't think there was anything going on in my head I was just yeah in a complete daze with it all yeah again it was you had um you had physical um trauma yeah. on the accident I mean I again when I went back through that old whatsapp thread to find out you know what we what we talked about I, I saw the picture of your your ribs and it's just like I don't know purple just yeah. all over you yeah um but you also had emotional trauma yeah. which didn't just happen on that night no. it happens for weeks and yeah. months after yeah. that. so every time the doctors said well it's not quite what we're expecting yeah or you know you had the police investigation and you know you'd get some news there and all of a sudden that just yeah and again you you were sat in a flat on your own i'd tell yeah. you you had luna with you that's your dog uh, no luna wasn't with me no she, she went to stay at helen's parents because i was at the hospital all the time mm-hmm. so it's just completely empty yeah and we were the the weekend after the accident we had already exchanged contracts on our house and we hadn't started packing yet and it got to like the wednesday and my mum and dad pulled me to the side and said you, you're moving in a few days time um, I'm really sorry to bring it up. Like we've got to do something. So we all rallied. To, well, they all rallied together and helped pack the house. And then, in the interim between moving, I moved into a flat while Helen was in hospital. So I just ended up in this flat that was really unfamiliar to me. It wasn't certainly not like being at home. Just in this flat on my own. Um, yeah, no Luna, no Helen. Just yeah, just me and my thoughts really. That was not a nice place for you, was it? <laughs> no, definitely not. No. So that did obviously put paid to your boxing, certainly in our co- cohort. Um, yep. You did help me because yep. we, we did some training. You said, okay, well, if, if I'm not able to, to fight, then at least, you know, I can train. So I went along to your, um, you'd introduce me to a gym over in Saltash. Yeah. Um, I think actually wasn't the, the gym owner, one of the firefighters. Yes, he was. So the the guy who owns that gym, and I didn't know, but he is also a firefighter, and he was actually one of the guys that that cut Helen out of the car and got her on the spinal board. Um, I know him quite well because we both trained at his gym. Uh, and we had no idea at the time that he was actually the person sat behind Helen, supporting her and talking to her to keep her calm. Um, so he was in the car with us in like what was the most horrific moment in our lives, and we had no idea until I went to the gym. 
a couple of weeks later with you and he was like yeah i i actually attended the, the scene and i was like completely like wow yeah. <laughs> what's just happened Unbelievable. yeah Unbelievable. and he did he did say i can't believe you're both alive i can't believe you're both here like when they turned up they thought that there's fatalities here there's no way people have survived this so yeah which at that at moment that again that's more emotional trauma yeah because yeah. there's someone else um, saying in my line of expertise, yeah, people don't walk away from this, yeah, and then yeah. you're just yeah the emotional yeah roller coaster that trauma, particularly where you were at that time as well, because it's say you'd have still been in that flat, yeah, it's such a such a tough time. So yeah, it was. We did do a bit of sparring, and I did give you a black eye, didn't I? Can we just get that on record? <laughs> you did. <laughs> Whilst you had concussion, yeah, and went under the hospital for concussion and not allowed to box and not allowed to train, yeah, what were we doing that enabled me to give you a black eye? I well, we were doing sparring. I think, I think we were just doing shoulder taps. Oh yeah, no, was, of course it was. It was shoulder taps. So yeah, we were like, look, you're not allowed to hit me in the head. So we'll do yeah. shoulder taps and knee taps to work on like reactions and speed. Yeah, and you went for my shoulder, and I I ducked. Yeah. And I uh, put my my eye right in the line of fire. <laughs> yeah. So I, I went into hospital later that afternoon because um, we went to the gym between visiting hours and I went yeah. back and I sat down and Helen was like, oh, my God, why have you got a black eye? You've got a concussion. Yeah. <laughs> oh, dear. So there we go. At least I've got that on record. I did give you a black eye. So you did. Fine. You did. Um, so you did eventually fight. You did get in the ring. You did Good. complete... Uh, the ultimate white collar boxing uh, again yeah, yeah. let's just echo back to what you said earlier if i set my mind to something and i say i'm gonna do it i do it yeah um so a head-on collision didn't stop you no. um, a covid national lockdown just stopped you i think it was you were a week on before. the Tuesday for the Saturday night fight. That's it. Yeah, Saturday yeah. Night, wasn't it? Yeah, it was like four days before. Something. Some the universe was trying to tell me I shouldn't be getting in that <laughs> ring. You know, they threw a car at me for a global pandemic, and it was like it's not stopping me. I'm getting to that ring. It was, and I think so, it was, yeah. was it September? September last year, September yeah, 21. We finally got there, and even then, the security didn't turn up, and they said, "Look, we're not fighting until the security turned up." Yeah, we thought it was going to be cancelled. Yeah. And I don't know if I've, I've mentioned this before, before to you, but you were like a caged tiger yeah. at that moment. You know, you get you watch a tiger just pacing up and down, just with all this energy yeah. and focus and raw anger ready to be unleashed. Yeah, and it was it was a surreal moment because we were all just there to have a good night out, and we were all we had our glad rags on, and we were having a few drinks, and you're just like you got your game face on. Yeah, you're yeah. like, for God's sake, you know that they, they, they phoned a the car at me, they phoned a global pandemic, and now they're still trying to stop me. I'm here. Yeah, you know, this is two years later, but eventually you did get the green light. You did get in the ring. Um, it lasted, I think, a bit longer than one minute nineteen seconds. Yeah. You didn't finish second either, did you? No, I finished first, which I was pleased with. Yeah. It was. And it was a hell of a fight as well. Uh, yeah. I think they really, unlike my fight, they paired you up very, very well. I think yeah. it was um, I, two good fights, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah, I think so. I watched it back uh, when it was released on YouTube, the, the video. And, and at the time, when when at the end of the fight, I thought it was going to be a draw. I had in my mind, I think this might be a draw. Um, I don't think he's edged me. And I know I put him down on the floor in the second round. And I think that's just what swayed it for me. Um, but yeah, I thought this, I reckon this might be a draw. But yeah, I was really pleased to uh, to get the win. I was there. Uh, after all that time of waiting to get in that ring and do it, to get the win was just like the cherry on, on top, really. So... How did that feel? Two year, almost two years later, to stand in that ring, have your arm raised, yeah, and turn around and see Helen stood, yeah, cheering. Yeah, it was amazing. Yeah, 
<laughs> you're you're trying to make me cry because you oh, know how emotional no, no, no. I get. Not at all. It's good with you, different ratings, though. If you do want to, yeah, very you've seen me. You, like, because my eyes are welling up. You've seen me now. You know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. It was, it was amazing, amazing. And not not just to see, well, yes, yeah, obviously to see Helen there because I actually came and watched your fight while Helen was still in hospital and while I was going through all of that. And I remember thinking I should be fighting tonight and like, I can't believe the position I'm now in compared to where I was three weeks ago. Like this is nuts. And, you know, I was really pleased for you that you went in and and got your moment in the ring. And I just felt really like, I wish I was just doing this and life was normal again. Mm -hmm. So to then be back two years later and have people like yourself um, and my friends who had all sort of been there for me throughout and see, and Helen there stood up clapping um, was just amazing. The, the the only slight thing that annoyed me was after about two seconds of celebrating, my mind was already on my next challenge. I was like, okay, I've done that. I've won. Well, what's next? <laughs> Literally, that was it. I was like, cool, that's done. I, yeah, I won. Yeah. Um, what's next? That, that <laughs> and, is the and actually, the isn't it? And I already knew what was next because I had already had a green light for another challenge. So my mind was just onto that then. So yeah. When you say green light, is that Helen giving you a green light? <laughs> no that's uh that's a production company giving me a green light <laughs> yeah. so go on then walk us through walk us through that what happened next um well after the boxing mm. so the boxing was in september um and then three weeks afterwards um nearly to the day of the boxing i was sat on a plane at heathrow airport um departing to fly out to jordan in the middle east to a desert to take on another challenge Jeez, so this was SAS Who Dares Wins, yeah? That's right, yeah. yeah. And we, we've we've talked, obviously, a little bit throughout this process, but what on earth made you want to do that? Because there is a line <laughs> that they yeah. say in, at the end of every episode, do you have what it takes to you know, join the most elite band of brothers. And every yeah. week that comes up, I can immediately go, no, no, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What on earth were you thinking? I don't know. I'm watching it back now and thinking about it. I'm like, what was I thinking? <laughs> no, I, I'd love to challenge myself, whether that's menti- mentally or physically, like e- either one, bring it on. I'm, I'm happy to challenge myself at both. Um, and I like to think I can hold my ground at a lot of things as well, mentally and physically. Um, so I guess really it came down to, to two reasons I wanted to do it. One was I wanted to see how far I could push myself, especially after bouncing back from such a sort of traumatic thing and suffering with mental illness following that in the, in terms of PTSD and sort of bouts of depression off and on. Um Anxiety. I never used to be an anxious person, but suddenly I was getting worried about things. I would never normally, I was getting tight chested about things that I would never normally given two thoughts to before. So it just changed me a lot. And you start to question like, okay, what if I'm feeling like this? Am I almost weaker than I used to be? Um, or have I not become softer, but you know, why, why am I now like this? I don't, maybe didn't feel as strong as I did before because I was struggling mentally. So I guess I saw this as an opportunity to be like, do you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna push myself here, and I'm not gonna go half assed at it. I'm gonna do something big. Um, and my my second reason was sorry, you hadn't seen the show before, so you didn't know what was coming. Oh no, I had seen it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, so I had um, also thought that I wanted to show that as a man who suffered with mental health, suffered these type of things, that that doesn't make you a weak person so I figured if I could go on that show and do well and come across as a strong recruit and hold my ground on there then and and I can also be vulnerable and open that I have suffered with mental health and it shows that actually you can still achieve things it just because you suffer with with bad mental health you go through stages like that doesn't stop you from achieving things it shouldn't stop you from wanting to do things I'd like to focus quite heavily on the application process so we would for those listening who haven't watched the show we will have some spoilers in here so please do watch the show first we are going to give away some spoilers but primarily for business owners i want to focus on this application process because just like helen's recovery just like um me lasting one minute 19 seconds in the boxing ring um you beat the odds and 
we went, we went through this just now, didn't we? So 31,000 people applied for the show. Yep. Uh, you were number 19. Uh, there were 20 people on the show. You were number 19. Now, I don't know if that means you just made the cut. Or are they just starting random numbers? Yeah. No, they, they count it backwards. They start at 20. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I remember having a conversation with you at one point, and you're like, well, they, they haven't told me that I'm in, but they've asked for my shoe size and my inside leg measurement. I'm yeah. pretty sure I'm in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so 31,000 people applied. You were one of 20 yeah. who made it through to the show. That is uh, That's out of 1,000. 550 to one so those are the odds you beat just to get on the show so regardless of how you did on the show yeah you have beaten 1549 people yeah to get on the show yeah how did you do that um i guess first of all i put myself out there so I put myself in the mix because if you're not in it, you haven't got a chance from the get go. And that's whether that's whatever you do in life, um, especially that translates into, into business perfectly. Um, if you don't try and you don't put yourself out there, you will never know. Um, and you can beat the odds. And, and quite often the odds are always stacked against you in life and most things you do. If you're pushing yourself anyway, um, if, you, if you are trying to progress, the odds are always going to be against you. You, you, you never go into anything thinking, oh, yeah, I've definitely got the upper hand here. This is going to be easy. It's always, yeah, but I reckon I can do this, you know. This is going to be a challenge, but I think I can overcome this. So, yeah, I think the first important thing is to put yourself out there and not be afraid of rejection. Yep. Um, because I did actually apply the previous year to this season, and I didn't get on. Mm-hmm. So I got a fair way through the process, and then I just got blanked. I heard nothing back. Um, okay. they suddenly stopped replying to my emails I didn't hear anything so I didn't even get told no you haven't made it I just had to sit in radio silence and wait and then before I knew it the season was starting and I was watching the other recruits on TV thinking I should have been one of them Wow so did you reverse engineer that and kind of say okay so I did well up to this point or I could have done better at this point and this was the point at which point they ghosted me yep so I now need to look at what did I do wrong there yeah, that I can that next time I can recalibrate and yep. you know go differently. So what I did was I applied and I got through the first three interview stages, mm-hmm. and then I posted on Facebook and said, "Wow, amazing news! I've got through stage three of the interview process to go on SAS. Who dares wins? This is exciting!" And then suddenly, radio silence. So the moral of the story is. Is it don't count your chickens? Don't count your chickens until they hatch. Is that what they say? Yeah. Or yeah, yeah. Don't you know? It's not a done deal yet. So why are you shouting about it and making a big thing about it? So I learned a big lesson there, which is it's never done until it's done. Um, so yeah, you just need to stay in your lane, stay quiet, concentrate on yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, so, uh, the show is all clouded in secret. So actually. Blowing that secret out of the water at that stage is probably it's a like, big no-no. You know, yeah, door, a bit like celebrity in the jungle and all those kind of things. You're not allowed. You know, no, I mean, I guess I wasn't given the green light to tell to officially tell people I was on that show until two days before the first episode aired. Mm-hmm. So it aired on the Sunday, and they gave me the go-ahead on the Friday afternoon. They said you can now tell everybody that you're on. So two days before. And there's me before I've even been accepted on shouting my mouth off before. So. Yeah. Which, which it's not, now you can identify that and say that's a red flag. Yeah, you know, they they want people who can keep you know the spoilers under wraps. Yep. So if at early stage applicants go boasting on social media, that's not the sort of person that's going to be good for the Definitely show. Not. No. Um, Again, kind of looking back at reverse engineering, what you know, what are they looking for? It's not necessarily um, how do I get on the show, but yeah. what are the production company looking for? What do they want from the stars of the show? I think there's a, a couple of things, really. One is they want a background story 
They want something that's going to maybe pull on people's heartstrings or people can get emotionally invested in, um, which is understandable because it's a TV show. It's entertainment and it needs to have that element to it because I don't know about you, but if I was watching 20 people I don't know and I wasn't emotionally invested in them and I didn't think, oh, go on, or I want to root for you or, oh, I hope they do well, I'm going to have no interest whatsoever. Um, So I think that's one thing they look for. And, And I guess another is... It's just how you come across. Um, so part of the early stages is you need to do a video recording of yourself, mm-hmm. giving an overview of why you think you'd be good to go on the show, um, a bit about your life, um, a bit about achievements you had in the past, uh, and a bit about who you are as a person. Mm-hmm. I think there's not a one particular thing they're looking for. When you look at the different people that are in there, out of the 20 of us, not one of us is the same. We're yeah. all very different people. There's alpha males there's quieter, there's alpha females, there's quieter, there's there's people that are big in stature, there's people that are small in stature, there's, there's people from all different walks of life, um, there's business owners, there's people that aren't business owners, there's younger people and slightly older people. It's a real mixed bag, and I think that's what they're looking for, is, is they're looking for, I think if they find too many of the same people, it'd be again, it'd be very boring to watch, and you know, not everyone's going to like everyone. So there'll be people that would have watched it and thought, do you want number 19? I, I like him. I'm rooting for him. I want him to do well. There'll be other people that'd be like, oh, I can't stand that number 19. He's always crying. <laughs> you could say that about all of them. I think they all have yeah, crying. Yeah, at yeah. Um, I, I think, yeah, again, if I'm if I'm the production company and I'm I'm looking at this, I've got to say, right, okay, yeah, you've got you've got to be able to cope with the cameras. Yeah. Uh, because this is a reality TV show. So when you are in the middle of a task and there are, I don't know, three cameras pointing at you. Yeah. You can't be gurning for the camera. No. Because it's got to be capturing what's going on. Yeah. Um, When you are sat doing your, your piece to camera about your story, you need to be articulate. You can't be, um, yeah, we, we had a, um, a car crash. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, no, you've got to be able to talk articulately. Yeah. Um, you've got to have a character. You've got to yeah. have a bit about you. Um, and yeah, the backstory. I mean, just off the top of my head, you've got um, the uh, guy who's, whose mum was killed yeah. in the Manchester bombing. You've got um, the guy whose brother was murdered. You've got the yeah. transgender firefighter. You've got the selective mute. Everyone's yeah. got that that backstory. Yeah. That. Again, if you think from a production company point of view, over six episodes, they want to tell stories. Yeah, that's it. This person uh, is um, this person's a bit of an arsehole. Yeah, haha. <laughs> but they're a bit of an arsehole because yeah, what happened to them as a kid. Oh shit. Oh, I think differently. You know, boom, they told that story. Yeah, this guy over here. Oh, he couldn't cope with the driving task. Well, that's because he had a head-on collision. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Do you think they deliberately made you fail that driving test? Did they no. make yours harder than anyone else's? No, uh, I mean they left me to last. They let everyone else go first, and you weren't you you couldn't see what was happening. Obviously, when people were off doing the task, so you didn't know what you were supposed to do and what was a pass, what was a fail. So they left me until the last. So I was the last recruit to take on the challenge. So I had a lot of time to sit there. Uh, and stew over it and that's why he asked me do you want do you don't want to quit do you and I said no I want to give it my best and that's what I'll always do in any situation there's there is not many situations that I would walk away from and not give it my best Um, so I had to give it a go the difference between that challenge and other challenges is I also did quite a high abseil down a building and I am really scared of heights Mm -hmm. however there's a big difference between being scared of heights And actually having received therapy for PTSD following a car accident, which is a completely different thing. So I've had people say, wow, it's really good you face that fear. And whilst I I really appreciate the feedback, it's really nice people see it like that. It was a whole different thing. Like that was, that is something that getting back in a car was was a big thing. Um, So then to get in a car and drive through a mock war zone with explosions going off and someone screaming at you and telling you to go faster mm. and shout and make a decision, what are we going to do, um, was very, very triggering and very difficult thing to do. Um, and do I feel like like I was exploited a little bit? My trauma was exploited a little bit for entertainment purposes? Maybe, but I signed on the line and I always knew that was a risk. I was happy to share my story. 
So that's just part of it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. We, we come out stronger. Hasn't it? Sorry, I was just going to say, has anybody to come out stronger? Would you say? Did I come out stronger from that? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I came out stronger from the whole experience. Um, I think, as you can see, they, they, when you watch it, they take me in, and I get quite emotional, like talking about it. Which, but I can sit here with you and talk about it. It's okay, but there. There's there's no sleep, hardly any sleep at all, hardly any food, and then I've just done that driving challenge and then been yanked in a room with a thing over my hood and told to talk about the trauma. It was just very, like, triggering, so it was quite hard to hold it together. Um, but as you say, I think I still articulated it well, considering I was under quite a lot of stress and emotion. So, yeah. That's probably what I want to do a little bit, is to strip away your defenses yeah by depriving you of sleep depriving you of calories yeah um by pushing you to failure deliberately to failure yeah, yeah. and then disorientating you and putting you under stress and literally putting you on on the, on the spot and saying right talk about the most vulnerable point in your most recent history now yeah go. um yeah. you aren't going to have that your defenses up you they're talking to the raw yeah energy within you yeah that's how it felt as well mm. yeah we all put on a brave face when we talk about things that upset us and we all have this sort of way of doing it but when you're broken down to that it's very hard to have the energy or the the sort of strength to to then keep that up you just you kind of just have to give into it and be like yeah this was awful and this is how i feel about it yeah but yeah it was interesting there were a few instances um i think it was Yours were the driving task, and I think there was the guy who failed the leadership task. Yeah, where immediately after it had happened, you went back into the into the sort of living area, and someone would kind of try and console you, and you'd be like, "Go away, I, I don't want to talk about it." Yeah, and it was the def- the defenses were up. No yeah. way, I need to process this. Yeah, yeah, and then the DS is. Let you get your shit together. Yeah. Let you give you throw yourself a little pity party if you want. Yeah. And then right, hood on, get in here. Right. Let's sort it. Let's talk about it. you're going you're yeah. going to talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> it definitely, yeah. That's definitely what they do. Yeah. Is that something that you can now pull into your life anytime you want it? That something can happen to you, you can throw yourself a pity party. You could put the defences up and say, I don't want to talk about it. And at some point, you can summon those guys. You can summon Foxy and just say, right, he's going to be sat there in front of me, bearing down on me, going, yeah. fucking talk. Yeah. Oh, 19, talk. Yeah. Yep, definitely. And I think I think it's an important message that it's, it's good to talk about things. It's good to um, say how you really feel about situations. And I, I just don't think people do it enough um and i think it's quite liberating to to speak especially to people that you don't really know actually like i don't know them um as, uh, like the only time the only thing i know of them is that they were screaming in my face and telling me i'm a worthless piece of whatever <laughs> and um uh, yeah trying to make trying to push me to to my limits um so i didn't have any like prior relationship with them other than they shout and scream at you yeah. so to then be sat in a quite a calm quiet environment with them asking about your life and stuff they've got a very good way of making you open up um definitely definitely have their whole demeanor the way they talk but I think I think they know it's important to talk as well. These are guys that have served in the forces for years. The stuff they must have seen and done, they they know it's important to talk. Um, they're not silly, and and the, the whole thing is around that. It's a self development show, really, isn't it? When you look at it, it's we're going to take these people that yes, they've been through traumatic things, which a lot of people have, but we are going to use it as entertainment. But also, it is going to be good for them. Like they can, you know. The accident, the car accident happened regardless. Like, I've got to live with that. Helen has to live with that. It happened regardless. So why not try and get something positive out of it? And if they want to use that, then I'm happy to be like, well, actually, yeah, it did happen. And if they, if that can help me have an amazing experience where I can go out to Jordan and jump out of helicopters and push myself to limits and see all these views and meet all these people, why not? <laughs> it happened anyway, so why not? Yeah. There was some... Um... So when they had you in that room doing interrogation, um, 
about the accident. Um, I can't remember who it was. It wasn't Foxy. It was the other guy. He just said to you so matter of factly. Yeah, but that's in the past, isn't it? Yeah. She's, she's right now, isn't she? Yeah. And it was, have you been able to compartmentalize that in the way that they are able to just go, yeah, this this shit happened, but that was in the past. Right yeah. now, right now, this is the situation. Yesterday, the world had gone to hell in a handcart. Yeah. Today, everything's fine. Yeah. So um, whilst I appreciated that feedback from him, I, I kind of felt like it was a bit of a misunderstanding around mental health and how that works. I don't think it's as simple as going, well, that was yesterday. So, f- so forget about it and move on. Like life doesn't work like that. People's brains don't work like that and emotions don't work like that. You know, someone's child dies. You don't go, well, that was two weeks ago, mate. Get over it. Like it doesn't work like that. Um, and everybody's brain is different and everyone deals with traumas in different ways. Yeah. So what might be traumatic to one person might not affect someone else the same way. Um, and that's not through choice. That is through how your brain reacts. Like it's a real thing. Um, I think you've got to be careful to not just use that as an excuse all the time and yep. to just tell yourself that story all the time. But I also think there's a balance to be made where it's important to recognise that and understand that sometimes just saying, man up and move on, it's done, isn't always the right approach. Yeah. yeah. I, I yeah. Don't Servicemen bit coming out of it, coming out really. In fact, like you said, they, they see all sorts of stuff during that. Yeah. Time stuff like that and actually that's how they kind of deal with it they, they have a shit day they talk about it they move on to the next shit day yeah and then, but that obviously does the damage because long term the servicemen that are leaving out, outside of that support network that they would once have had uh, we see that in the street the servicemen are really struggling out on you know in civvy street so to speak aren't they with that yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Get them through that day to day but after that it becomes a bit of an issue that's it yeah so i think that message is it's okay in certain scenarios, but but not not so much in others. And, and everybody's different. Um, you know, you could say, yeah, it's in the past. Like she's all right now, move on. And like, and that's fine. And I have like since the accident, I've set up my own business. I've ran a marathon. I've got in the boxing ring and taken on that fight and won. I've done. Oh, you ran a marathon who, with Helen. Yeah, with Helen. <laughs> I've done SAS. Who dares wins? Um, the list goes on like I've achieved lots since then so I don't let it hold me back I don't let it stop me doing what I want to do in my life but it's important to recognize that it still hurts and if you drag me in a room hooded or make me drive for a mock war zone and trigger my PTSD then drag me in a room hooded starving hungry and calorie deprived and not seeing my wife for over two weeks at this point it's going to bring up emotions so to make me cry and then say well, it's done now, isn't it? Forget about it. You're like, well, yeah, but you've kind of stripped me back here a little bit. So, yeah, yeah I think it's a bit out of context because if I bumped into you in the street and you asked me about it, you wouldn't see the same person you saw sat in that chair talking about it. So, yeah, it's not a true reflection, really. So that was the best thing. Put that in a box. What, yeah. What's the next challenge then? Em- embargoes aside. <laughs> yeah, i um, so you know what? I'm I'm actually not too sure. I've got a few races booked. I'm I'm looking at maybe some ultra marathons, but I think it's time now. I mean, we got me and Helen are going to climb Snowden next week, so we booked a bit of time away to go and do that. Um, we can uh, we've got another marathon booked in October, and I've got a few other races and stuff. But I think it's time to concentrate on the business a little bit. Um, last year, obviously, I had a lot of time off going to Jordan. A lot of time like was taken up headspace training for SAS so I think now it's focus on the business I've set some business goals and um yeah and I'll just carry on enjoying doing my fitness doing some runs until I think of the next big thing I'm sure there will be one uh, yeah by the way there is a train that goes up snowed and you don't have to climb up <laughs> nah, I might try and push it up <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've got a couple of quick questions Okay. Just about SAS once again. Yeah. So just before the kind of the um, escape and evade exercise, they obviously sleep deprived you. They uh, deprived your calories. Now on the show, they brought in four apples. Yeah. Was that literally four apples between nine of you and nothing else? Yep, that is it. And, and like, we could not believe it. We were like, ah, they'll come in with another bit of food in a minute. That's for camera. And uh, they, oh. ne- they never did. My next question then. How do you divide four apples between nine people? Because I think this is a task in itself. I think they've gone right. Let's. It's this was on the leadership episode. Yep. So 
Who decides how to divide four apples between nine people? Because it doesn't easily go. No, it doesn't. What criteria do you use? Do you just say, let's make it fair, everyone gets the same? No, no, actually, your basal metabolic rate is higher. This person's <laughs> really struggling, so they get more. There was one person that said, oh, I, I don't mind having a bit less. Yeah. What was the process for dividing up those apples? Well, we got in, and one person said, I don't mind having less. So everyone went, okay. <laughs> 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 one guy's like, come on, I've got my yeah, yeah. You, you made your decision. You made your bed. <laughs> um, no, I, I. Do you know what? I can't even remember. I stayed out of it. I went and sat. I went and sat with one of the other recruits, and I thought, I'm not. I'm not a team leader at this point. Everyone's getting a bit touchy about food. Everyone's very tired. We knew it was coming to the end of the course because we know how long the course is, and this was on day nine end of day nine and we knew it was 11 days long and we know that the last two days are the most brutal so i just stayed out of it uh and then i just received a little like less than half an apple at that in like two mouthfuls and that was it i don't know if you heard but they had, someone said oh there's a fly on one of the apples and i actually said oh, i'll eat the fly at this point more protein yeah <laughs> yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah fantastic so what is your ambitious lifestyle business looking like now tom yeah, it's going really well, uh, I'm pleased to say. So um, it, it gives me the flexibility that I've always wanted in, in terms of like the work-life balance. So my office is based from home, so I can get up and start work nice and early in the morning. I normally aim to start about 6, 6.30, because then by the time it gets to 9 o'clock, that's, if you think about the, your standard sort of day, that's when most people are now clocking off for lunch. Um Oh, or, yeah, so they're clocking off at lunch like 12 o'clock and I've done that much work and it's just got to 9am and most people are just getting in and hanging their coats up. So I find it really productive because I finish work most days at 2, 3 o'clock. Um, and quite often I will take a day off um, a week, an extra day off a week, whole day. So depending on the workload, I'll be like, uh, it's not too busy. Let's take off Friday, just take the whole day off. So, yeah, it's um, I also earning good money doing it. So. I'm happy. I'm not. I'm not earning millions. I don't really have any desire to earn millions right now. It's just as long as I can pay my bills and go away and take on different challenges. And me and Helen go away on a couple of holidays a year. Then I'm. I'm happy with that. Definitely. Yeah, yeah, you take the ambition box many, many times over. Um, you're yeah. taking the lifestyle box as well now. So well, well played to your number nineteen. Ah, thank you. Thank you, staff. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. So if people want to want to find out a bit more about you, Tom. Where can uh, they, go? they can go on Instagram, so it's just Tom Bolden, or um, you feel free to go on Facebook. I mean, as a friend, I put a lot of stuff up on there, um, and my company is Complete Mortgage Advice. Cool, and that's CompleteMortgageAdvice.com? Co.uk. Co.uk. Yeah. There we go. Thank you All very right. much for joining us, Tom. Cool. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. So there we are, another episode in the can. Um, how was it for you? Please let us know. Um, how do you listen to these podcasts? Um, please leave a review on that platform. Let us know what we can do better, what you like, what you don't like, and how we can improve to make this show even better for you. We'll see you next time.